Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Thanks for checking into the best Houston sports podcast and joining me for a special tribute to Akeem Olajuwon is my co-host Stephen Curran. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to go back in our classic archives from a decade of Houston Sports Talk interviews so you can hear what Akeem's teammates and Houston iconic journalists said about the dream, Akeem Olajuwon. Stephen, hard to believe this year marks the 30th anniversary of the Rockets' first championship. Oh, man, that is hard to believe. I mean, I remember exactly where I was and, you know, even what I was doing, not just at the moment that the Rockets won the championship, but gosh, I can, you know, look back and just know what my life was like then. My, my kids, I think my daughter was like four. My son was a year old. And, you know, now, of course, they're both grown, but I wasn't even doing sports writing. I live in Austin and I've lived here since the 80s after I left Houston, but I was doing morning radio in 1994. And funny thing about that, Robert, I remember when the Rockets did win that championship, I stayed up late, like probably every other Rocket fan until one or two in the morning. And of course, I have to get up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock to do the morning show. So you can imagine, but I woke up and I still was on a, an adrenaline kick. And I go into work and I go on the air and I actually had a copy. And it's, and it's the real thing, by the way. A friend of mine had given me a copy of Hakeem Olajuwon's outgoing message, you know, that you have on your answering machine. You know, where he says, hi, Hakeem, I, I can't come to the phone right now. So <laughs> I did a little bit pretending to call Hakeem on the phone and played that, of course, on the air, making it sound like I was trying to reach him. And of course I didn't, but that's the one thing I remember about that night or the morning after the Rockets championship. Gosh, it's hard to believe it's already been 30 years. That's a great story. You know, I, I was at the University of Missouri, having just finished broadcast journalism school, working part-time, looking for a TV sports gig. The internet was not a thing. So in the <laughs> final few minutes of the game seven versus the Knicks, I called one of the original Houston Sports Talks co-host, Anthony Geagle, one of my best friends from high school. He was in Houston. So I had him turn on the radio, turn it up so I could hear Gene Peterson and Jim Foley on the call. And Stephen, I just really needed Gene's classic, how sweet it is. Oh, me too. And and along with that, Robert, since I, as I mentioned, I live in Austin, you know, AM signals, when you get too far away, even at night, they, they can go pretty far, but they don't stay in all the way. So I'm listening to the game on the radio. You know, it, it comes in, it comes out, it comes in, it comes out, you know, through the whole game. But ask me if I care because it was the Rockets game and I was going to listen to it. I didn't, you know, it was on television, of course, but I had to listen to Gene because back then, if you're a Rockets fan, you were also a Gene Peterson fan. And to, to hear him say how sweet it is at the moment when they win their first championship, man, that, that's something you just, you can never forget. One of my biggest regrets in life was not jumping in my car after that Knicks game and making the 15 hour drive back to Houston to see the parade, man. I just, I still regret it. Ugh. Man, I wish I just could have been there. And, and you know, the, the funny thing about that series, you remember, I can't remember, was it game five that it was interrupted by the chase? Of course. The OJ Simpson chase. So that was another wrinkle that was kind of thrown into that series is, you know, here I'm sitting here wanting to watch the Rockets Knicks game. And they pretty much missed the whole game, if I recall, due to that chase. So, you know, that's something. But yeah, that would have been something to take part in that parade. Because you think about it, Robert. Yeah, there'd been some other championships before that. I mean, the, the Oilers won, you know, the AFL championship in the early 60s. The, the Houston Arrows of the World Hockey Association had won the AFCO Cup of the WHA in the 70s. But this was one of the, the baseball, football, basketball, the three major sports. And Houston was still looking for a championship, and the Rockets gave it to them. Gosh, I just remember what that celebration was like, just hearing about it, seeing it on television. Man, that, you just can imagine how all of us felt at finally winning one of the big three championships. Yeah, and just Akeem being a part of that. I'm going to talk about that whole connection there of Akeem redemption and all of that. But Stephen, in my bedroom as a kid, in Sharpstown, I had a Nerf hoop on my door. Never had the size of the hands to do the dream shake with a real basketball, but probably like a lot of kids <laughs> back then, I'd practice the dream shake with my Nerf ball and hoop, you know? Oh, who wouldn't? Like I said, if you're a Rockets fan, if you love Akeem, you're going to try to you know pretend to be him when you're playing basketball. And you know, Robert, when I think back on how Hakeem got as great as he did, and you may remember when, when he first came to the University of Houston, he was such a raw player. But before he even got there, people were talking about how great this guy was going to be. And remember back then, he went by Akeem Olajuwon, not Hakeem. That came later. I think it came in the mid-80s, if I recall, that he started going by Hakeem Abdul Olajuwon. But you know, before, when, when he was at the University of Houston and in early days with the Rockets, he was Akeem Olajuwon. 
And everybody was, I just heard so much about him before he even got to the Cougars. And then, you know, how he led to the Cougars, he and Clyde, of course, to those final fours and those two championships that they just fell short on. You know, I, I remember thinking at the time, man, it would be such a dream come true. It probably will never happen. But boy, it would be great to see Hakeem on the Rockets. Well, you know, the rest is history. Of course, he did end up on the Rockets. So it was quite a dream come true. And the fact that he finally did get not just one, but two championships with the Rockets kind of made up for those years with the Cougars in the finals. Yeah, let me talk about that for a second. And just the whole the whole arc and arc of my life. He's such a huge part of my life. Vice Lama Jamma started when I was 10. The championship losses to North Carolina State and Georgetown, I was 11 and 12. At 23, I'm watching him get revenge on Ewing from the Georgetown <laughs> loss. At 24, Akeem and Clyde lift that championship trophy 11 years after that NC State debacle where they snatched the title from Akeem and Clyde. And Stephen, I'm going to hold up as I'm mentioning that. I've got the Believe It Again oh, yeah. Chronicle Special Edition with Akeem and Clyde, you know, slapping hands and the high five and all that. It just the 94 was special, but the 95 was special because you're a Cougar fan and you go back to loving Akeem from back in those days in the mid 80s. And then, you know, after all of that, at age 30, I moved back to Houston working for Channel 20, doing video production for the Rockets telecast. Unfortunately, I just missed Dream, who had retired the year before. Not retired, but had gotten free agency over with yeah. the Toronto Raptors the year before. My first assignment for halftime of a Rockets broadcast was putting together a tribute to Akeem. Of course, that airs the night that he plays the Rockets as a Toronto Raptor. And I just worked incredibly hard on that video tribute. It's on our YouTube channel. I'll put the link to it at the end of this video. But Lisa Miloski was the Rocket studio host who introduced my tribute. And Stephen, I'll never forget, walking into the studio after my piece ran, and we went to commercial, and Lisa told me, she said, hey, I love the piece. She said she was holding back tears uh, as the piece was going on. So that, that was all you could ask for. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's nothing like, you know, somebody complimenting you on a show or, you know, in, in your case, a piece like that, you know, involving someone great like Hakeem Olajuwon. You know, I just mentioned what a great dream come true it was for Hakeem to be on the Rockets, but how could you have even thought that you would not only have Hakeem, but you'd have Clyde on the team in the second championship. I mean, Robert, this is just like a movie that just keeps getting better and better as you go along. You couldn't write a better script than that. It was a love story because oh, it was man. Valentine's Day that they reunited. And That's right, when the trade was made. Yeah. The whole, the whole thing, those whole two years were, uh, they were storybook. You, you couldn't create a movie that was as good as those two Rockets championships. And, you know, you, you had that, a big Cougar connection because not just Hakeem and Clyde, but Carl Herrera was on that yeah, team in 95. Right. And I mean, just all, all of that connection to Houston. And it was just, it felt like such a Houston championship. And, you know, we're going to have a tribute. Also, uh, look for that in the archives down the road as well for Rudy Tomjanovich and some of the great stuff that we have from him over the years. But, you know, to see Rudy get that championship, I'll talk a little bit about that when we do that tribute. But him, him to be getting that redemption for him for all this stuff that he had been through in his Rockets days. But the thing about Akeem, Stephen, is, you know, and, and I got to, be around him a little bit, you know, covering the Rockets, just seeing him, not really talking to him or anything like that. But, you know, he just, he looks like royalty. I mean, he does actually look like royalty. No. He ha There's a presence. There is a movie star quality to Akeem Olajuwon that you just can't quantify. I, I don't know if you can ever have somebody in this city that will be more aligned with Houston the way Akeem was. You, J.J. Watt is pretty close, but Akeem, because of his college days and that connection, I think, is what makes it so unique. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have both the Cougar connection and the Rocket connection. And, you know, there are just some people, whether they be athletes, movie stars, singers, or even just, you know, normal people who may not be famous, but they just have that it factor. It's not something you can put your finger on. It's, you know, I guess you could use the word intangible it factor. And you can't always define it, but some people have it. And you're absolutely right. Hakeem is one who has it. He still has it. I mean, even though he hasn't played in so many years, you still hear his name referred to off and on throughout the NBA or throughout basketball. His name still gets mentioned. So you know that somebody like Akeem has withstood the test of time when that happens. Yeah, without further ado, let's hear some stories about Akeem. And if you're listening to the audio version, you're about to hear from Akeem's five slam jamma teammate, Reed Geddes. After Geddes, it's Rockets beat writer for the Houston Post from 1980 to 1995, Robert Falcoff. Then it's Akeem's 86 finals teammates, Robert Reed and Rodney McRae. After that, Rockets coach in the early 90s and UH Cougar legend Don Chaney. Then you're going to hear from Lisa Miloski, who covered him for over a decade with the Rockets. After Miloski, it's Dream's Clutch City teammate, Chucky Brown. 
then Akeem's teammate in the early 2000s, his final years with the Rockets, Moochie Norris. And we're going to close it out with Robert Falkoff one more time. And don't forget, you can find most of those full interviews on our Rockets Classic YouTube playlist. So go check that out if you haven't already. But let's start the whole deal with Reed Geddes. Let's talk about the man, Akeem Olajuwon. You see him for the first time. Uh, what do you remember about that? Skinny. Skinny. <laughs> yeah, he was just he was so skinny. You know, it's funny because Akeem showed up, and I think he got here maybe in December or January, but mid-semester, and they redshirted him because he was just he physically wasn't ready to play. So that December that he showed up, uh, and they decided to redshirt him for that one semester instead of burning a year just to play a semester. I was a senior in high school. The day that Coach Lewis and Coach Swearock came out to my house for a home visit was the same day that the old Houston Post ran an article on Akeem. And he's on the front page and, you know, hanging on, hanging off the basketball standard and just looked like he arms and legs that just went forever. It was interesting because, you know, my dad and I were talking about it. He, my dad was talking about, what would it be like to play with that guy? And so when Coach Lewis and Coach Swarock were in my house that evening, my dad and I and mom, we were sitting around talking to him. And I said, hey, can I ask a question? And they're like, yeah, sure. I said, what about this Akeem Olajuwon guy? You know, they both kind of looked at each other and smiled. And Coach Lewis goes, well, what, what about him? I said, is he any good? And they smiled and they go, not yet. <laughs> and I said, but, but you think he's going to be good? And they smiled, you know, with this, this, you know, knowing look between them. And Coach Lewis goes, yeah, we think he's going to be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> And in more ways than one, he was a big part of the reason why Akeem Olajuwon was a Rocket and as great as he was as a Rocket, not only because Olajuwon ended up with the Rockets, partially because of that deal, but really Moses was the guy that helped Akeem Olajuwon develop in, at those nights at Fondy Re- Recreation Center, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, some of those legendary <laughs> summer nights at Fondy when uh, Akeem was you know, a real thin guy, a defensive shot blocker, but didn't really have the offensive game. He went down and really toughened up uh, in those Fondy games, and uh, that helped him when he got to the NBA to handle the physical nature of the game and to become uh, ultimately the player that uh, that he would become. And certainly Moses was a big was a big part of that. What was it like playing with the young Elijah? Wan? And give us your your best dream story, if you would. You got to remember, a lot of people thought the Rockets were wrong and and taking Rodney McCray instead of Clyde Drexler. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But you know, you got to realize this is what they were looking at. Okay. If we get Clyde with his athletic ability and the player that he was, now you got a little conflict with Ralph, and then we got a team. But look what we did. We were able to, to get Rodney and myself, and me and Rodney used to say, do you realize we're the best small forward in the league if you add up our points and rebounds together? <laughs> so we were able to mesh as a team. Now, my best goal of our dream, I'm coming down the floor, and when I was playing the point, and I hear this voice saying, Bobby, Give me the bomb on, and I look, and I see three guys on him. I said, Dream, you got three guys waiting for you. That's okay. I took on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I just gave him the ball, and he dunked on him. <laughs> and the fun part about Dream's game is when he started getting that, getting in that groove, he'd get the biggest smile and laugh on him, and he said, bring it, on, bring it, on." And, and you, you had to enjoy it. You had to love his enthusiasm and his love for the game. Tell me what it was like to, to be around him on a regular basis. Uh, when the guys ask you what it was like to play with Elijah, I'm sure your players ask you, what, what are the stories that, that you think of? Well, when I first saw him, of course, I played against him at, uh, in the Final Four. The first thing that came to mind was, man, this guy is a great offensive player. Because, you know, they never really threw him the ball and uh, until after, you know, me and Clyde came out the same draft. The next year, you kind of saw his offensive skill. But like I said, Michael Young was still there. Michael Young was still there. And uh, Elijah Wan, that's the first thing that came to mind. I was like, this guy has great footwork um, offensively. I didn't, I didn't know he could do that, but he was doing some things out there just on his talent and ability and being a student of the game. You're saying so once he understands and learns the game more, that he's really going to be uh, tough to, to defend. He was already hard to guard just when he stepped on the floor as a rookie. And you just say, oh, this is, this is going to be a problem for the league uh, the opponents for years to come. But he was a hard worker. He loved to not only practice, or compete in the games, he loved practice. Um, he's just one of those guys that when I – later on in my career, uh, or my career was over, people would ask me, was MJ the best that, you know, you ever played with? I was like, MJ, no no doubt, is 
one of the best players that ever played the game. But I'm not going, you know, slight take anything away from him, Elijah Wan, because he was a great player. And you were you were there that game. You were playing with him that game where against Seattle, where he had about 48 and 24 or something like that in the playoffs. I'm upset. Still upset about that game because we had home court advantage. We lost the first two games in Houston, and uh, we went down there and won. And that game you're talking about, there was a missed call. I wish they had instant replay where me and Dream came down on a break, two on one. I probably, looking back, I should have laid it up, but I dropped it off to him, and he laid it in. He laid it off the glass. They hit it after it came off the glass. They wound up fouling him. He went and knocked down two free throws, but had they counted the basket, we would have came back here for game uh, seven, which we felt, though, if we could get it back to Houston, that it would have been another matchup with the Lakers um, the next round. So, But that game was back and forth. He was incredible. We couldn't, they couldn't stop him. Um, but it was one of those uh, situations where losing – Two games at home caught up to us, and um, we made some mental mistakes that cost us the ball game and ultimately cost us the series, uh, not being able to get it back here to game seven. But I remember that game like we just played it yesterday. You guys both coached Akeem Olajuwon. Did, did you get any advice from him? Did you call him and say, what do I do with this guy? Do you have, do you have anything you can tell me? No, I'm just, I'm just happy to have a guy like Akeem who was so talented. Uh, and, and, you know, you can tell that he was molded earlier by guy Lewis. Uh, and I, I mean, Coach Lewis, I mean, he, he really, if you want to talk about a player coming in raw, King came in fairly raw. He has natural given talent, but Coach really molded him into a very good player. And uh, when I got him, he was just ready to go. Akeem Olajuwon, what do you remember about him? What is the story that sticks out of all the time that you had spent covering him, almost a decade? Well, a couple things. You know, Dream was absolutely one of my favorites. Uh, one of the things I remember is that Dream is Muslim and very conservative. Um, he was in that looking for a wife kind, you know, behind the scenes, didn't talk about that stuff. But I remember being, because we were friends and we had known each other, he was respect, he was very respectful. I remember walking in once and he was putting on his after, you know, after he got out of the shower, he's putting dabs on his neck. I said, wow, dream. That smells so amazing. Cause I could smell it from, I wasn't sitting, I wasn't like right next to him, but I was standing up and he told me it was from a prince in Nigeria. <laughs> I'll never forget that. He was so funny. I said, wow. And then the first time that, it was announced that I was going to be working for NBC, the national broadcast. He he said to me, basically what he said was, Lisa, much deserved, long overdue. You know, you are great at what you do and, and I'm, I'm proud of you and excited for you. I mean, it was like, wow, you realize that he does, he pays attention. And, and he, I hadn't said anything to him, but he knew when he found out about it. And then another, <laughs> Charles Barkley is, is still a friend of mine and he's funny and I love Charles, but Charles is Charles and he could be very inappropriate in the locker room, meaning just he's loud and brash and just sometimes a little inappropriate. But I understood Charles's kind of sense of humor. He was like a little kid. He was like, he's like a 17 year old boy. And my sister was in town, my sister, Linda, and he knew Linda. And he said something out loud about, Hey, what's your sister doing after the game? Or, you know, just something that was inappropriate. Well, dream caught up with me in the vomitory as we're passing some going to, I think dream was going out into the basketball court. And he said, Lisa, you should not let Charles disrespect you like that. <laughs> I, said, I felt really bad. Cause I thought, Oh, dream. What should I have done? But I said, you know, dream, I know. I said, but I, I feel like with Charles, you have to kind of roll with it and just let him be himself. And, and Dream was just didn't want me, didn't want anybody else to, to think that it was okay to disrespect me, which I, you know, I understood what Dream was saying. And honestly, I think it happened after, um, I think he, that he was offended by it because John Saunders, who passed away now, he was covering for Toronto because he, he covered, he was a broadcaster for them, the local broadcast. So he happened to be in town and John Saunders was in the locker room. And when Charles started bellowing out in the middle of the locker room. You know, John didn't really know who I was. I think Dream was worried that other people would think like, well, what is that all about? He's asking about Lisa's sister. What is she going to let they go party with John? <laughs> no. I mean, Dream knew that wasn't the case. We, we never, I never went out with the players. Um, he always had my back and um, he's just really, it holds a special place in my heart. And he gave, he gave me a jersey, a signed jersey. And I only have two, one from Clyde and one from Dream. And the signed Hakeem is in my son Dylan's room and Lukey has the other hanging in his closet. <laughs> Describe what it's like to play with Akeem Olajuwon. When you tell your grandkids, what are you going to tell them about playing with Dream? Uh, how easy it was because, you know, you could get beat on defense and Dream was there to help you, you know, and, and we knew that, you know, as long as we helped him, he would continue to help us. So once you got beat, you knew he was coming, so you knew to get to his man so that, you know, his man wouldn't get an easy dunk or, or layup because then he'd be upset and then, you know, a, a big guy would be hesitant to come and help him. You know, if nobody's going to help him, you know, why, why should I – you know, risk helping you. So I think that was a good thing about that team uh, was that we helped each other. But, you know, playing with Dream, he just made things so much easier. And, and you know, my field goal percentage was probably the best of my career while I was playing with Houston because Dream would get double teamed a lot and I would just cut to the basket and Dream would just drop the ball off and I was getting layups and dunks. So 
Um, you know, he just made it so easy. Everybody in Houston, we're all partial to Akeem Olajuwon and his greatness. But it seems like in recent years here, been talk about you played against Shaquille O'Neal and even big mm-hmm. men like David Robinson and, and now Tim Duncan with all his championships. Kind of Akeem right. gets lost a little bit in the shuffle there. Do you feel that he was the best you ever played with or, or, or against? And how do you compare him to those other big men at the time? I definitely think he was the best guy uh, that I played with. And I played with a lot of guys playing on 12 different teams. And I think Dream was the, by far the best guy that I played with. As far as the comparisons, you know, Shaquille O'Neal is a great player. He was a powerful player. But Shaquille O'Neal didn't block the shots like Dream. And I don't think Shaquille O'Neal rebounded like Dream. I thought Dream was simply a, just a better all-around player. Um, Shaq was probably the, the more powerful, stronger guy. But as far as overall player, shot blocking, rebounding, passing, and all that kind of stuff, I think there's no comparison, you know, with with, uh, with Dream as far as that goes. You know, I think Dream is by far better. With Akeem Olajuwon, it's it like a dream come true because uh, when I was younger, I was, you know, in middle school, I was bigger than most of the kids, so I played forward, and I wanted to be Akeem Olajuwon. I had the atonic shoes, the jersey number, everything. It was just a joy just to have, you know, my dream come true and be able to play for the Rockets and actually play with Akeem. What can you tell us that maybe people wouldn't know about Akeem or, or Yao? Akeem, he's a great teacher. Uh, he taught me so much um, how to take care of my body, how to prepare myself, just how to be a pro. Uh, he, also, he talks more than people think with his teammates and stuff like that when he's in the locker room. Maybe not as much, you know, when we out when you're out in public and things like that, but uh, he's a great person. Learned so much from him. You had watched uh, Akeem Olajuwon for several seasons leading up to the championship. Can you describe his growth as a player? Was it something that happened that particular year, 93, 94, or was it a slow build towards the dream of Kim Olajuwon MVP year? Yeah, it was, a, it was a slow build. Physically, he was right at his peak in those 94, 95. He was uh, just the best of the best. He, he peaked physically, but it was more than that. Earlier, um, when he didn't have quite the pieces around him, he felt like his best way to score, even if he had to go through a double team, try to split a double team and score himself, he felt like that was a better option than passing it to maybe a guy with a better shot because the guys you know around him didn't uh, didn't come through that often. So you know where I think that some people earlier characterized him as a selfish player it wasn't that he just wanted to win so bad and he had such great talent that he could uh, he could split a double team or, or take on two or three guys and score anyway and maybe feel like he had a better chance to score than you know giving the ball to an open guy. But he did he did get better as a passer and the trust that he gained in his teammates that was the key when he realized and could feel the double teams and, and, and was a willing passer. And then the ball started hopping around and the Rockets would wind up with, you know, easy shots or be able to split somebody and drive. That's when they really kicked it into overdrive. And that's when he became really what I consider to be a, you know, an MVP, true MVP type player. And so I think it was, it was, it was two things. It was him uh, maturing, becoming fully ripe as a physically as a player. And then also the Rockets doing a good job of recognizing what they needed to put around him. And then, teaching him that the percentages, as Rudy said, uh, told me, you know, uh, yeah, maybe earlier he, he felt like the team had a better chance to score if he just went against a double team and tried to score as opposed to giving it to the open man. But over the long term, and if you want to be a champion, percentages say you can't get away with that. And so when he gained trust in his teammates, which he did in 93, second half of 93 and then into 94 and 95, uh, that's when, you know, that's when he became the greatest rocket ever. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk. Hey, don't forget to support us by subscribing and commenting on YouTube. You can always listen to us on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends about us and share our show links on social media. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening.